Uh, good afternoon. I'm glad to be here. Um, I do research in dry land areas, but um, it's uh, required me to start to understand uh, better soil quality in general. And I think um, I have some more specific data. Um, there's a lot we don't know um, about uh, soils and soil organic matter, but I'm going to uh, tell you what uh, some things we have learned. And I'm going to emphasize uh, properties that uh, soil organic matter affects with um, data that's been collected. And I'm going to talk about uh, two ways we can make use of that information in farming um, from what we know already. Okay. So uh, the bad news is we don't understand a lot about organic matter from a scientific perspective. But the good news is that we do know uh, a lot of uh, good things that we can do and effective things that we can do. And there's some, some of those practices that aren't being um, very well used yet, and we can uh, learn to use them better. So uh, soil organic matter, uh, just a definition, uh, is the byproducts of living organisms. And they remain in the soil, um, more or less, uh, permanently and basically uh, definition of soil requires that there be living things having lived in it and organic matter having accumulated. Um, it's important to understand and I think it's been emphasized quite a bit but um, organic matter imparts properties to soil that are far out of proportion to the amounts and I'm going to show you some data that, that uh, looks at that and it, I think it's pretty striking. Um, we used to have more organic matter in the soils. That's before we started farming them. That's, that's true all over the United States. I think that's true all over the world. Cultivation uh, tends to decrease the natural soil organic matter. Um, I consider um, soil erosion probably our number one issue in, in terms of sustainability. Part of the reason is that uh, soil organic matter leaves off the surface when we have soil erosion. But after soil erosion, probably the, the most important uh, productivity issue that we have with sustaining our soils and using them for another hundred and, and on, hopefully a thousand years from now, is um, preserving the productivity of our soil by um, paying attention to soil organic matter. Because it's the one thing that we can really influence to some extent. Okay, so um, you've actually seen um, a little bit of data from um, the data that, um, that Dan Sullivan showed um, with uh, the manure applications on some soil from Pendleton. Um, this is actually that same, those same fields. And this is a pretty complicated looking, looking graph, but we're going to go through just, just line by line here. This is a treatment that for 70 years, at this is the point this data was taken, it was about 70 years. Every other year, um, the arrow disappeared. Okay. There we go. Um, every other year in a, in a wheat fallow rotation, uh, manure was applied. It's 10 tons of wet straw manure, probably effectively five tons of dry manure. Um, I'm going to have to keep that moving, otherwise it disappears. Okay. Here's here's a, a treatment where uh, pea vine was applied. One ton of pea vine. Every other year, 35 times, about uh, 70 years. Um, <laughs> okay, and then these treatments are all more conventional. These are all black fallow. These are all old-fashioned plow, cultivate, rod weed, uh, no surface residue. Uh, it's an old-fashioned experiment started in, uh, in the 30s and maintained, uh, still maintaining it today. Okay, so. There's my arrow. Um, so these are more, uh, so, so here's some treatments where the uh, residue is burned in the spring. There's one that's burned in the fall. No, no fertilizer N added in these, pretty extreme example. But here's more reasonable amounts of fertilizer nitrogen applied. So here's, here's the ranking of total carbon. Now carbon is how we measure soil organic matter. I will use those two terms uh, interchangeably, soil carbon, soil organic carbon in soil organic matter. Um, this would be about, uh, so, so if, if this normal, kind of a normal wheat fallow rotation has 2% organic matter, um, this, where we applied manure, 
70 years later is up about 2.7 percent. So that's a pretty substantial increase in, in organic matter. Here we applied one ton of pea vine, which doesn't seem like very much to me, and no, no fertilizer nitrogen with it. It, it. it adds, a pea vine had about 30 pounds of nitrogen in it, equivalent. And it actually has a pretty good little bump in organic matter, just changing, just uh, adding pea vine to this system compared to a more typical um, wheat fallow recommendation for nitrogen. What's, what's interesting about this is that if you look at the water stability of the aggregates in this soil, this, these proportions are even a little bit larger than the total carbon change. So this, if this one is 100% or 1.0, then relative, um, we have a, a pretty good increase in water stability. Okay, so that's not a big deal. This is one of those soil tests you do, uh, you know, you do in the lab. So what, what does that mean? If you look at ponded infiltration rate, that is if I take a, uh, a chunk of well casing, stick it in the ground so the water doesn't, doesn't escape, and watch how fast, if I pour water in there, how fast is the water absorbed? into the ground. Now we look at this, this little, this increase in soil organic carbon, soil organic matter. That increase has cost uh, over a threefold increase in the rate that water can be taken into the ground under that manure treatment. And it's over double where we had this little tiny bump of soil carbon. Okay, so we're talking about small changes in soil carbon, soil organic matter. We're talking about really substantial changes in the soil properties. Okay. And this is in a soil that does not, this is, this is a, pretty typical of our soils. Um, this is in the, the um, Pendleton area. Uh, we maybe have a little more clay than some of your soils, but um, nationwide this would be considered pretty low soil carbon. But a big influence, a big influence on uh, infiltration rate with just a small increase in soil carbon. This is a runoff ratio, so if we, d we did the intensive work of measuring all the water that came off these plots, indeed this infiltration rate that we measured uh, with a test in the field, it does relate to how much rain runs off those plots. Okay, so here's the same soil. So here's our manure, here's our pea vine. These are higher, a little bit higher in soil organic carbon after all those years of, of adding those amendments. Here's our low, lower soil carbon. Here's our typical system. Here's where we burned and didn't put on any nitrogen. Okay, so, so here's, my, here's my little um, action photos here. So I've got a piece of gauze in here so we don't stir up the soil too much when we add water. Um, one thing to notice pretty quickly is there's a little bit more sediment there um, and that has to do with that aggregate stability that we measured in the lab. Okay, this, this is stirred soil. This is completely tilled soil. Um, and we're just taking some of that soil, putting it in a tube, pouring water on it. And the first time we add water, we can see the difference in soil properties. Okay? If you had repeated rainfall events, which is the way it happens in the real world, this, uh, the soil with low carbon that we're seeing even seeing uh, right away, we're seeing uh, slower water infiltration. These will crust much, much faster than these. And that's why water runs off of these plots long before it would ever run off these plots. Okay, so, so even in a completely tilled soil, small changes in organic matter have a big effect on water infiltration, on crusting, and runoff. And uh, this is just a, a little data set. You see that repeatedly if you, um, everywhere I've measured it. So increasing organic matter improves most soil properties. Okay? This is just one of them. Okay, so what about the effect? Uh, so, so let's say we don't have access to lots of manure or, or organic amendments. I mean, let's face it. Uh, we're farming to grow organic things to sell, not to put back on our soil. So we don't always have these things available. So what happens if we just change the amount of tillage we do? Okay, so, so here's, a, here's a study. This is a wheat pea rotation. It's been in, at this point, it's been in place for about uh, 40 years. Here's a minimum till. Um, it's now no-till, but, um, but really most of the time in this uh, 40 years, it was uh, just a, a single sweep operation. Um, after the wheat residue or uh, before planting peas. 
Compared to a fall plow, which used to be a typical operation, is no longer, uh, people are no longer hot on that, but a lot of people still do some kind of plowing or spring plow. Here's a disc chisel. Um, so, so these are kind of uh, gradients in how intensely we're uh, either tilling the soil and in the fall plow we're leaving that soil bare all winter. And that has an effect on, again, what we're looking at here is uh, water inf infiltration. This is, uh, these are inches per hour. So uh, typical soil, and you might see this in the soil survey, you know, they said, well, maybe, you know, maybe half an inch or so an hour for uh, water infiltration. If we go to uh, much less tillage, leave the surface residue on the top, and um, we get uh, substantially, much significantly more water infiltrated, or a higher rate of water infiltration possible. And also notice that it's really a gradient. Here's bare soil all winter. Here's the same tillage, but done in the spring. Um, so a little more soil protection. Here is less soil disturbance, less inversion, less bearing of residue. Uh, you probably wouldn't see much residue left on this uh, treatment. And here we are, we're minimizing the amount of, of soil stirring. So it shows up really clearly. And, and uh, these, these are striking differences when you uh, watch the water going in the ground. We'll never get runoff off of the, something like this, whereas we do typically get um, storms that will erode soil off of these treatments. OK, here's another system, just another example. Um, here, the only difference uh, between these three treatments is the initial fallow tillage. These are an old-fashioned black fallow, again, uh, way back in the 60s, they were interested in the difference between plowing, disking, and sweeping as an initial tillage. But then after, after these tillages were done, they went and used a cultivator and uh, rod weeded several times. It's a black fallow situation. The only difference is how much tillage did they do at the very beginning? How much soil mixing is there? And you can see that there's about twice the water infiltration capacity uh, where we do less tillage compared to the, the old-fashioned standard, which was the plow. Okay, so, so um, tillage somehow makes a pretty big difference in those soil properties, and, and this is what's going on. And, and I've seen this data for, um, uh, for Illinois also, soils. Um, and, and this is what we see if we look at the organic matter, soil carbon, organic carbon in the soil. So here's increasing organic carbon. Here's the surface soil. The soil here's the soil surface. This is a zero to three inch sample, three to six inch sample, and then down to a foot and, and deeper. So what we see is if we have that, that um, minimum till sis system, we have more carbon staying near the surface, but that carbon just, just isn't more carbon really, it's just that it's not getting buried. There's less carbon if you go deeper. The same if you look at the uh, chisel system. The chisel system does a little bit less soil mixing, a little bit less soil inversion. There's, so there's more carbon in the surface and less carbon uh, deeper than if you take a plow and you mix it. Basically, this whole plow layer here is almost uniform in soil carbon. You notice these lines cross right about in the middle. Um, we are not seeing and this is typical, this was true in the Illinois study too, where they studied like 43 different sites. We are not seeing an increase in soil carbon overall, if we measure deeply, um, with less tillage. What we're seeing is we're seeing more carbon near the surface. And as it turns out, water infiltration has a lot more to do with the interaction of the surface and the air that it has to do with anything deeper. Once we get the water past the surface, uh, I've had no problem infiltrating high rates of water. So it's the surface is where the action is happening. And basically um, what I've observed in many more tests than this and different ways of looking at it, we're basically getting a soil crust. Now you think of a crust as being dry, but you, you get that consolidation of soil. And that is, can be incredibly uh, impermeable to water. But if you can prevent that crusting from happening, and there's two ways. One is high organic carbon content. And the other way is protection with residue. Both those things make the aggregate stronger. Strong enough to reduce slaking. 
which is when the aggregates fall apart and then they flow with the water and plug whatever holes there are. That's what you get. That's what a crust is. It's the soil particles have settled together. Well, they can't settle together if they're glued together into aggregates. Or if there's residue on the surface that reduces the in, uh, raindrop impact, freezing and thawing, wetting and drying. Uh, so residue by itself will make the aggregates uh, withstand more, last longer before crusting. Organic carbon will do the same thing. And remember the first study, we're talking about a completely plowed system. Um, the pea vine, the manure, added some organic matter. Those were much uh, more stable soils. They uh, with, uh, withstood the um, raindrop impact. They did not crust. And they had much better water infiltration. So basically, um, if we can increase soil carbon, that, that's, a, that's a wonderful thing. If we can't increase soil carbon overall, if we can't bring in more carbon, uh, we can at least make sure that carbon stays on the surface. That's where it does the most good. Just um, some more examples um, under stubble conditions. So, he so here's, here's this, uh, some of the same, same studies, but now I'm showing, uh, so we have, we're using a um, wheat fallow system. So we have, if we leave the stubble in the field, we get much better water infiltration. So we get about twice the water infiltration with the stubble as we do uh, under the condition where we've um, planted our winter wheat, going into winter wheat. And the same is true um, in a conventional tillage. And the same is true in no-till. But even under the stubble conditions where we really probably won't get any water, any runoff here, it's still far less than if we allow, in that no-till system, if we allow the soil carbon to build up right on the surface, top inch. Okay, so, so um, looking at water infiltration, um, more soil organic matter means more stable soil structure, less crusting, less runoff and erosion. And it's the soil surface that really matters. So eliminating or reducing tillage is very effective because it increases soil organic matter where it matters. Okay, so now what about amendments? What, what, about, um, what about the different things that we add or leave on as residue on the soil? How do they affect soil organic matter content in the soil? So um, here we applied uh, lots of different, we even have more, but I'm, I'm, I'm cutting it down to the, the major ones here. So uh, biosolid, uh, we've talked about biosolid a little bit already this morning. Um, very effective. So, so here we are, um, we put on about a total of about five and a half tons per acre of carbon. I measured everything as carbon. So these all had the same amount of carbon put on them over a five year period. So that's about, about one ton a year. And then we let it uh, sit for four years and then I measured the soil carbon that was left. Biosolid is, for some reason, which I, I do not know, I can only conjecture, the bio, municipal biosolids was extremely effective at increasing soil carbon. And that has been very persistent. Um, so in other words, I've measured it just uh, recently and it's still there about seven years later. 39% of the biosolid we applied could be uh, still found in the soil uh, four years after we stopped applying it. Manure is pretty effective, 26%. Alfalfa, uh, not too bad compared to, we go down to the residue, the residue we most often leave on the soil, only about 5% of the wheat residue, same amount of carbon as these others, only about 5% of that could be, could be found in the soil then four years later. Here's our check, no amendment. Another um, interesting outcome of this experiment is that if you, if you just take the, the soil, these, we applied these both to a wheat crop and to a fallow soil. Um, so this is what the fallow soil, we actually saw a slight dis decrease in soil organic carbon over that period. But if we grow a wheat crop, in the last column, we see that uh, actually the roots are very effective. The roots of the wheat crop are much more effective than the residue that was on the surface. This is one, you know, I said there was bad news about soil organic matter and that the scientists don't really understand a lot. One reason we have trouble understanding what's going on in the soil and measuring soil organic carbon is that we uh, have not figured out a way to measure the input of roots. You think, well, why don't you dig them up and wash them off and, and weigh them? Well, 
you, you don't even know if you get a quarter of what the roots are putting down in the ground in terms of carbon because uh, you heard about exudates from the, from the roots. Le roots are leaky. Roots have root hairs. They're so tiny you, you can't even see them. There's no way you can pull those up and weigh them. And it's happening all during, it's as if leaves were falling all year long. All the while that crop is in the ground, the roots are giving off exudates. They're growing new root hairs. The root hairs are getting eaten. Um, there's just no way. Uh, people sometimes say, well, it's probably roughly about the same as the tops, you know. So roots probably have about the same amount of carbon going into the soil as the tops do on top. But that's just a wild guess, really. Okay, so that's one of our problems with measuring soil organic matter and saying, okay, if we remove this much in uh, straw for mushrooms or whatever, then, then you know, this, this is how effective it is on changing soil organic carbon. Well, we, we just don't know how much the roots are putting in. So we don't know how much to credit the roots in that equation. But um, with this trial, we could see that there was a big difference where we had roots versus where we didn't have roots. And the roots are, were very effective. And in general, um, scientists agree that uh, the roots tend to be, root matter tends to be more effective, just like biosolid tends to be more effective than, than some other um, carbon substances, roots tend to be more effective than the residue, uh, the above ground residue, the top, the crop re residues in increasing soil organic carbon. So some organic materials increase soil organic matter long term. And here's an example of biosolids and manure, pretty effective. Others seem to just disappear really quickly. And um, there's a lot of research on it, but we just really haven't made it I personally think we haven't made a lot of headway figuring out why. Uh, roots tend to be more uh, effective than straw. The data that I've seen shows that, and the data that I produce shows that. Um, another thing to consider is that perennial plants tend to invest more in their roots. So roots are pretty effective at increasing soil organic carbon. Uh, crop like if you're growing um, grass for grass seed, um, that's known to increase uh, soil organic carbon um, pretty much long term. and pretty effectively. Um, we, don't, we don't necessarily have that option, but if you, want, if you really have a soil you really want to give a boost to soil organic carbon, then uh, perennial grass uh, would be a good one. Okay, so, so we don't understand soil organic matter very well. Uh, among the other components of soil, I say we understand it uh, pretty poorly, even though we're investing a lot of time looking at it. Another problem is that with uh, the science of soil organic matter is that we don't have a good definition. So if you can't define something, you can't measure it. So we have, an, we have a problem is when we grab a soil sample, how deep should we go? How do we get consistent depth when the soil surface is getting fluffed up, and compacting and all? How do we get the same amount of soil each time? Do we include the fine residue stuff that came from that crop that year. I mean, if you wait a couple of months, some of that stuff will be gone. Um, so when, when you take your sample, do you pick out all the roots? Do you take out all the residue? Is that part of it? Is that part of this real organic matter? Well, believe it or not, soil scientists haven't agreed on that yet. Um, they haven't even seemed to consider it very carefully. So, so we don't have a real ac accurate definition of what we're talking about when we talk about soil organic carbon or soil organic matter, and therefore we have trouble, we have some conflicts in sometimes in our measurements uh, when we measure things. So don't be surprised to see some conflicting information. Some growers will, will tell you uh, honestly that they took a soil sample before and after doing something and they saw a big increase in soil carbon or a decrease or whatever. But it could be um, that those two samples aren't really defining things precisely. Um, here's an example um, of an in, some intensive sampling I did. Um, so, in a, so here's a soil, soil carbon. Here's a shallow sample. So there's about uh, seven tons per acre in my three-inch soil sample. I measured uh, 39 times once a month for over three years. Okay, and and here's an eight-inch sample. So yeah, there's more carbon in it because there's more soil. Uh, about 16 tons. Okay. The point here is that there's about 29% variation and there's some maybe seasonal effect. 
depending on what time of year I took it. I mean, after harvest, maybe there was a little spike because there's a lot of fine stuff in there or not. But um, the point is that when you sample and whether there was a rainfall before you sampled or no rain before you sampled, um, at the 8-inch sample, we had 16% variation. So if we're looking for small increases in soil organic carbon, which, which uh, is probably all we can hope for, uh, we do have some problems with accuracy of, of sampling and understanding uh, when to sample, how deep to sample, what to include in the sample, and then there's also different, different chemical methods I use in the lab. And they give you different results. So um, we're just not very precise yet. I don't think that should worry us too much, but uh, do be careful um, with the results you see and uh, don't get too uptight about them. Okay, so how do we restore or maintain soil organic matter? Um, we're trying to figure out, you know, there's a lot of interest right now for a lot of different reasons to increase uh, soil organic matter levels. Um, we'd also, um, one, one reason we're, we're thinking about this is because a lot of people uh, have opportunity to, um, to sell some of their, their uh, crop residues and have them hauled off. Well, one thing to consider in that is the um, fertilizer equivalents that you're hauling off your field. But then again, again we have the kind of the intangibles uh, that we, or, or non-financially definable uh, issue of soil quality and soil carbon. So um, I don't think we, personally, I don't think we have enough to make uh, close calculations. I, I like the calculations that David Granstein was talking about, um, and, and I hope we can nail some of those things down, but at least gets case studies where, where people are doing the financials on their, on their own enterprise and, and telling us uh, what we should be uh, paying for manure, whether we should be bothering or not, and things like that. I think that's really important. But as far as saying that uh, hauling off a certain amount of crop residue is going to do this or that to your organic matter, or this or that, um, to increase or decrease it, um, I, I think that we have some, some real challenges in that. Um, so, so here's the logic. So we can be logical about things that we don't even understand, right? So the simple logic is carbon in, uh, subtract carbon out, and that's your gain or loss, right? Okay, so it's just like, uh, just like weight gain, you know, calories in, calories out. How, you know, there's great logic to that, but there's a problem in terms of weight loss and soil too. We don't know this. We have no idea what this is. Okay, so, so that we, we can measure carbon in accurately and we can measure whether the, there was a gain or loss uh, given we, there's a lot of variability and we're not very accurate, but we, we can theoretically. But this is what we want to know. We want to know why does carbon go out, which substances are faster or slower at, at gaining or losing carbon from the soil. Um, but this is what we really don't know. So we're not sure why some organic matter is retained and some is lost. Uh, people used to think, or a lot of people do think, I should say, I'm convinced <laughs> otherwise, but some people do think that wheat straw is tough to break down because it has a high carbon to nitrogen ratio. It's got a lot of lignin, but there's a lot of data that shows it disappears very quickly. Um, why didn't biosolids disappear quickly? Uh, I don't know. Uh, there's a lot of things we don't know, but we just don't have we don't have that part of the equation. Soils vary, climates vary, and crops vary. I'm going to show some specifics on that. We don't know how to measure addition by roots. I measured, I, I mentioned already, um, roots add a tremendous amount of carbon. They're probably quite effective at increasing soil carbon, but we don't have those numbers. So then it's difficult. This carbon out, that means we can't actually measure carbon in very well when we aren't, aren't including roots, we're just not, those aren't being included, so this equation is a little more difficult than it looks. And then again, definitions of soil organic matter vary. What do you mean, what are you gonna, what are you gonna measure, what are you gonna consider important carbon? So I, I hate to be discouraging here, but I'll now move to what we do know. Annual precipitation, soil organic carbon. These curves, don't worry too much, these are tons per acre of carbon, but this is kind of for, for a generic soil. Um, 
you know, you have to pick one because these things interact. So we're just picking, picking one and showing you the shape of the curve. So annual precipitation, if you're in the desert, uh, you go from, from uh, very little, a few inches of rain to 10 inches of rain, you get a big increase in soil organic carbon. This is, uh, these are soils, by the way, that relate to our, our region, uh, our region including all the way, uh, all of the desert, um, desert grassland and shrubland in the, um, in the western quarter, kind of uh, inside of the forest of the coast range between that and the Rockies. So, so these are soils like ours. They, they uh, took a huge survey. I think there are 630 soils here. They're looking at, so what's the relationship? So I told you we, we don't understand soil organic carbon, soil organic matter very well, uh, very precisely, but we can look at what's there and come up with these relationships. As we get into 40 inches and 60 inches of annual precipitation, then things start slowing down. But more, more uh, rainfall, uh, more soil organic carbon is what they find. Um, it's a different story with mean annual temperature. So here we are, uh, if, if your average temperatures are below freezing, and in the 25, that's average year-round day-night temperatures. Um, if it's a cold climate in general, um, then you're gonna have more soil organic carbon. And as you get warmer, as your average temperature gets warmer, so we're probably, what are about 50 degrees? Um, mean annual temperature, the soil organic carbon tends to decrease. This is just looking at the soils and uh, the soils that we have, the data that we have. Soil organic carbon increases as we have more silt. So for some reason, um, not real sure, although percent silt, you know, we've got sand, silt, and clay. so. You can see that uh, probably as the percent silt goes up, percent sand goes down, you're getting a finer soil. Um, some people think that this increase, as you increase in percent silt, uh, probably has to do with growing conditions, the ability to hold water. So better growing conditions for plants, uh, better water storage cap capabilities. So percent silt goes up in the soils uh, like ours, uh, soil organic carbon tends to increase. And then percent clay, it's the same thing. This is probably a little bit different, although water holding capacity probably increases quite a bit uh, with percent clay, but also um, soil organic carbon tends to stick to clay. Clay is sheets, they're, they're, they're tiny little thin sheets. There's a lot of surface area, there's a lot of, of um, ionic bonds going on, a lot of layering, so or organic carbon tends to get lost in the clay or stuck to the clay, and that uh, people, theorize and think that that protects it from um, microorganisms, bacteria, et cetera, getting a, a handle on it. So uh, percent clay um, tends to cause, uh, higher percent clay tends to cause more persistent uh, soil organic carbon. Okay, so, um, so where does that leave us? Here's a Ritzville soil. Um, this is uh, mostly silt, some sand. Uh, if, you, if you can see, um, you know, these are mostly, look like pretty clean uh, grains of quartz and feldspar, and et cetera. We are in a, uh, a low rainfall area. We are uh, fairly warm. We have um, sand, fairly sandy soils in a lot of areas. Some of them are pretty silty and we're very low in clay. So as other speakers have noted, we don't have very good prospects for high organic matter in our soils. We don't have high organic matter in our soils, in our native soils, and uh, we're probably never going to be able to retain high amounts of soil organic carbon for extended periods of time. You can apply them, but they're gonna disappear. Our soils just aren't good at holding on to, and our soils and our climate is not a good combination for holding on to uh, soil organic matter. So what's the other way to improve soil organic matter? Well, if you're just talking about the performance of the soil, um, the surface of the soil is where the real action is. That's where the roots want to be. Um, that's where the, the uh, crusting would occur. That's where we need to get the water past the surface. Um, so we can build high levels of organic matter at the surface even if we can't uh, build 
higher organic matter totals overall. So um, that leaves us talking about, really talking about surface residue. Unless you have sources of um, organic matter available, which uh, is wonderful stuff if you get your hands on it and if it works into your farming system. Um, but if you don't, um, surface residue is very effective at improving uh, water infiltration, even in the first year. Even if you throw residue over plowed soil, it improves water infiltration immediately. Um, but it's much, much more effective if you do that year after year, uh, have residue cover on the surface, the organic matter increases near the surface, and that improves water infiltration. If we minimize soil mixing and retain uh, residue, we can both have surface residue and we can have higher soil organic matter near the surface. I'm going to just show some, um, one example of, of a study that shows um, the effect of surface residue, which um, I, I think is, is rather striking. Um, I haven't written this data up yet, um, but I, I'm seeing it year after year. I'm in my fourth year. And it's been very consistent. These are called these lysimeters, weighing lysimeters. Um, so these are small. I like to do field work, big fields using farmer's equipment. But this allows me to manipulate each, each uh, surface independently. And what we can do is we can lift these out. This is more recent. Uh, uh, this was our last weighing of this year. Uh, we can lift these out, weigh them, and within a couple of grams, figure out how much uh, water has evaporated or been absorbed by rainfall. So it, it has uh, been surprisingly effective. Um, so here's, here's one uh, soil, uh, no residue on it. Here's, a, I called this 20% residue, and I called this 100% residue. I did not measure it uh, precisely, but those are just a little bit of residue and lots of residue. OK, so here's another graph. Uh, so let's figure this out. Um, so I, we, we weigh these things repeatedly over the summer. Uh, remember that I'm a, I'm a summer fallow researcher. I'm trying to look for ways to, to improve our effectiveness of summer fallow and reduce uh, soil erosion. So, so here, here we are at zero. And this would be gaining water due to precipitation. And here's loss due to evaporation. So, so on July 13th, I put, we put these out. And they're moist soil. We put them out in, in uh, the 13th of July. And, and, and it's hot. And so they start evaporating. And so uh, they're losing water. Um, the blue here is a loose surface. It's a tilled surface with uh, chunks and clods and stuff on it. And the red is a no-till surface. That's where we packed it all the way to the top. And you do get a little bit better of water transmission, um, more evaporation, that is, in a, in a surface that's been packed and has, uh, doesn't have any loose soil on top. But look what happens when, um, when we get a little bit of rain. So we got a little rain this summer. And between this measurement and this measurement, they gained water. Okay. And then uh, it's, the rain stopped, and they dry. These are wet soils. They dry fast, and then it slows down. This is kind of this is probably pretty much a typical slope for evaporation over a long period of time, a whole month during the, the summer, no rainfall. And then we start to get rainfall again, and they gain water. Okay, here's what's striking, and I've I've seen this uh, several times now, several different experiments, and it matches what I've seen in the field. Uh, measuring in farmers' fields. And that is that. Um, where we had 100% residue, we get much better water capture when we do get those rains. And here's the 20%. And this was the one that was bare, completely bare. You can see that difference in water capture even in, that, in the little bit of rain we had here. This solid line goes right to the top. And then it stays there stays on top, and then it comes up, and then it comes up. And this continued. Um, the lines get kind of confused later on. But um, I'm noticing um, slightly better yields in our no-till, even in Pendleton, um, with lots of residue and in an untilled system. I think that's due to the effects of residue on the, on the surface improving water capture and a lot of that has to do with how fast the water penetrates and how deep it penetrates. 
So my point is that uh, surface residue, um, you know, we, we won't count it as soil organic matter when we take a soil sample, but I think that's a big part of our picture, a big advantage we can have. As we look at uh, soil properties, I think residue cover is uh, going to prove to be a very profitable practice where we can do that. So more surface residue, uh, better rain retention. Doesn't matter whether we tilled the soil or not. And the, but the effect of residue, if, if you're in a, I don't know if any of you are in the dry, doing dry land and non-irrigated, but, but uh, the, the effect of residue, a lot of people wondered, well, if we do no-till, maybe if we do it enough years, we'll build up enough residue that we, tillage won't matter because we'll have that effective uh, mulch from the residue. That doesn't seem to be the case. Where residue helps you is, is in gaining water. Over long periods of time, um, evaporation ends up being about the same. But you gain water, and then for about a month after your rainfall, uh, surface residue has a big effect on, on soil water. And I think that that also has a big effect on, on plant stress, because even during the crop year, um, you have little periods of stress. And I think that dings our yields a lot in the Pendleton area. A little bit of stress in the spring, We've seen that recently uh, in the last few years, where you can reduce that stress through, um, through the surface uh, soil residue, or crop residue, leaving crop residue on the surface has uh, proven to give us a pretty good yield increase. Okay, so um, surface residue isn't pretty. Um, this, this crop looks nice. I can tell everybody did everything right and, and all. Um, Residue is messy. I wish I could uh, see it a little bit better, do a better job handling that residue, but I'm getting a little bit better yield in this than I am in the bare ground. So I can live with that. I'll learn, I'll learn to handle the residue. So in conclusion, it's difficult to change the amount of soil organic matter that we have in the long term, unless you have a good supply of something to add, and especially if it's something effective but it's important that um, organic matter be accumulated at the surface. That's where the real performance difference is made, especially water infiltration, but I'm sure also root health. And uh, the, the roots really liked, as David pointed out in his you know, orchard study, where he put organic matter on the surface, uh, the plants did better. Plants really aren't used to having, they're, they're used to having the roots um, right up as close as they can to the surface, but then they stop growing. When they get uh, too hot, too dry, too much exposure, exposure to light, they stop. They don't come up any, any higher, but if you have some residue on the surface, they can come up and exploit uh, the very surface. And I think it's important, that one of the most important things we can do about soil organic matter is keep the surf, soil surface protected with residue. Constant protection is a good thing. Uh, I think that's it. So, thank you.